Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome to module 2.5 of week two. And just to remind you what we are doing again, in week one, we obtained an expression for conductance and in terms of the time it takes for an electron to get through a conductor. And from there, we obtained two important results, namely an expression for the conductivity and this was obtained by considering a diffusive conductor for which the time that it takes for an electron to get through is proportional to L squared, proportional to the square of the length divided by the diffusion coefficient. So using this expression, we obtained an expression for the conductivity. And by considering a ballistic conductor where T is proportional to L, so it's just length divided by the average velocity. That is how we obtained the expression for the ballistic conductance. So these were the two important results from last week. And what we have done so far in this week is used a model that tells us how to calculate density of states. And the basic idea was that you think of these electrons as waves and that it fits into a box. And from that, you can get the density of states. Okay. Now, everything we have talked about this week dealt with the first relationship, this conductivity in diffusive conductors. So what we're trying to give you was a feeling for how this conductivity expression can be used. Now, what I want to do in the last two modules of this week is we'll focus on this ballistic conductance, the second one and use the same model, the model based on which we calculated density of states and all that. And what we'll show is a very important result that I'd say is kind of one of the seminal results of mesoscopic physics and in terms of small conductors, is that this ballistic conductance can actually be written as Q squared over H times M, where M is like an integer. And this is not obvious looking at this expression that we have obtained because here we had Q squared times density of states times velocity, which doesn't have to be quantized or anything. It could have any, any value. And what I'll try to explain is why that quantity can actually be written as an integer divided by Planck's constant, M over H where that comes from, that viewpoint will explain. And this has actually been experimentally, this was experimentally observed uh, about 20 years ago. And I guess in the next module, I'll show you one of the typical experimental results. But what I want to do in this module then is just explain why this quantity here can be written in this form. Okay. Now, if we just accept what I've written here, then the expression you'll get for M, you know, you could just view it as if we're just taking a bunch of variables and giving it a name. Okay. What isn't clear is why that thing that we gave it a gave a name to would have to be an integer, but that will come to. But let's say we just gave it a name. What that means is we are saying that M divided by H is equal to dv over 2l times this 1, 2 over pi or a half, depending on how many dimensions we are in. So all we have done is taken this expression from last week and said, let's write it in this form where m is this new quantity that we are now introducing. So, so far you see this week we introduced two concepts. The N of E, which tells you the total number of states up to a given energy, and D of E, which is the density of states. And now we are introducing a third concept, modes, M of E. And while density of states actually is a rather old concept that dates back to the earliest 
st uh, dates, uh, days of solid state physics, the concept of modes, this M of E, this you won't see much before say 1990 or so. This is something that became popular, got to be used a lot with the rise of mesoscopic physics. That is when people started making measurements on small conductors and ballistic conductors essentially. Okay. So now the question is that this is this quantity that you have defined. Uh, what would it look, uh, what, could we obtain an expression for this making use of the what we have done earlier this week, especially this relation that we said would apply in general to, I guess, any energy momentum relationship. That is D times V times P is N times the number of dimensions. So what I could do is here, instead of this D times V, let us write n times d over p. So it will be n times d divided by p. So all I did was instead of dv, I'm writing n times d over p. And of course, this d is the number of dimensions, so I could as well include it inside here. That is, 1 remains 1, this 2 over pi actually becomes like 4 over pi, and d being 3 it becomes 3 halves. So you could write it something like this and take the d off from here. Okay. So now n you see is we have an expression for it already here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so what we are trying to do is find an expression for M, capital M, and that's equal to H times this quantity. So it looks like H over P times N over L times half 2 over pi <clears throat> or three-fourths. I just took the two n there. Okay. Now n is this p over h to the power the number of dimensions. So when I multiply it with h over p, what we get is, so supposing I'm just using the n from here and replacing it, with this expression here. So what we would get then is M is equal to, you see, H over P times this, which would be like, let me step back a little more, equal to P over H times D minus one. Why? Because I had P over H to the power D, and then this is just the inverse, H over P. So when I multiply, I get P over H to power D minus one. And then there's this L here, which cancels out that L. So you'd have two or pi W or four pi over three A. But then I also have to account for these factors that I already had. So there's a half there. So the half and the two would give me a one here. Then there's the two over pi and pi w, which would give me two w. And there's a three over four times four pi a over three, which would give me like a pi a. So that's the basic result I wanted to get at. So just to go over it one more time so we make sure we got it. We are defining, defining this ballistic conductance as Q square over H times a quantity we call M. And at this time we have no particular reason to do it this way. 
but what we'll see is the physical meaning of m. That's what we are coming to. Right now, all we are doing is some algebra. We're saying, okay, let's call that m. So m over h looks like what I had before, one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions. And those factors come from averaging velocity as we discussed in week one, and it's worked out in one of those tutorials from week one. Okay. Next, we use the fact that the relation we had earlier this week, possibly the fir very first module of this week, the dvp is equal to n times the number of dimensions. So instead of dv, I put in n divided by p, and this dimension we took, uh, took account here. Okay. Next, we say, okay, so this is the expression for m, but we have an expression for the number of electrons, this n already, it looks like this. So let's make use of that here, and that is how we ended up with this expression for the quantity m that we have defined. Okay. Now what I want to point out is that now that we have this expression, it gives us a sort of interesting physical viewpoint about what m means. Okay. So think back about what this number n means. The way we obtained this expression, and that was in module 2.2, I believe. In module 2.2, we obtained this expression by saying that, well, if you have a solid, 1D, 2D, or 3D, question is, how many of these wavelengths can you fit? So supposing you had a, uh, had something who's, which has a, uh, like a two-dimensional conductor. So W one way and L the other way. So question is, well, how many wavelengths could you fit in? Well, it's proportional to the area, W L, and then you got pi W L times this P over H, which is like the inverse of the de Broglie wavelength. You see H over B, P is like de Broglie wavelength. So it's like W L divided by lambda square, right? De Broglie wavelength square. So what it tells you is how many wavelengths fit into the fit into that overall area. If you have a three-dimensional solid, well, it's a question of how many wavelengths fit into that overall volume. If it's one dimension, well, how many wavelengths fit into the length? Now, if you look at M, it is like one dimension lower. So if it's one dimension, well, M is just one. So when you have a one-dimensional wire, the quantity we have defined as m is just plain one, that's it. When you have a two-dimensional thing, then this quantity m is proportional to the width. And what it tells you is how many wavelengths fit into that width. And in three dimensions, that is you have a solid like this and current is flowing this way, what m tells you is how many of wavelengths fit into that cross section of the wire. So in three dimensions, n would tell you how many wavelengths fit into the entire volume. But m would tell you how many fit into that cross section. That's why it's proportional to the cross section. And that's the meaning of this quantity m really. That it is, in a way it, is, it tells you basically then that when current is flowing in that cross sectional area, how many wavelengths fit in, and that's what you call the number of modes. And those of you who, are, who have some familiarity with electromagnetic waveguides, you may recognize the word modes, but if you are not familiar, don't worry about it. But that's where the word modes came from. Now, why do you expect that to be an integer then? Well, as you might expect, that this is like the number of wavelengths that fit in. And of course, when you're trying to fit in wavelengths here, it has to be either one, two, three, four. It, you can, if you fit in like 10.5 wavelengths into a cross section, then of course, that would be a mode that would not be allowed. So usually, the number of modes is the, near, is the small, nearest integer. That is, what I mean is if when you calculate this, you get say 10.5, then the correct number m would be like 10. It's like the 0.5, that, that mode wouldn't be there. It would be like 10 of them. So the correct expression would be like the integer version of this. And 
This is what, of course, if you are using a wave equation to describe your electrons, this is the part that would come out naturally from the wave equation. That is the fact that it is an integer. But <clears throat> in our argument, the way we are thinking about it is that, remember, the way we found n, the same story here, that supposing we have a certain let's say some momentum p and these are the allowed values of momentum and you are asking how many of these allowed values are contained in there and that's what tells you the number of modes. The point is it would either be say 7 or 8 or 9, it cannot be 8.5 and that's why it's an integer. And this interpretation of course only becomes apparent once you write the modes in this form. You see, because if you go back to our original definition of the way we started, we said, well, what is the number of modes? Well, it's proportional to the density of states times the velocity. And then you see, it is no, there is no good reason to expect that it will be an integer. And so these are these two very different ways of thinking of modes. One is density of states times velocity which seems natural when you say that, well, you know, you have a certain number of states, density of states tells you how many electrons there are, and how much current you get depends on the number of electrons times velocity. So it seems natural that when you're talking of conductance, what should matter is density of states times velocity. But there is no good reason to think that that quantity would then be quantized. Unless you may, you know, you can make kind of once you know the answer, you could try to make heuristic arguments like saying, well, you know, this L over V is like time. It's like the uncertainty in time and the density of states is like the uncertainty in energy. And so the product of the uncertainty in energy and time should be H. But that's not a convincing argument. It's like something, once you know it, you could rationalize it probably that way. But the way you can see why it's an integer is, if we use the models we developed this week, and rewrite that quantity in this form so that you realize that that quantity is, can also be interpreted as the number of wavelengths that fits into the cross section of your conductor. And so if your conductor is one dimensional, the answer is just plain one. And so the ballistic conductance then would just be Q squared over H. If it's two dimensional, then what you have to do is look at the width, see how many wavelengths fit. If it's three dimensional, look at the cross section, see how many wavelengths fit. And that would be the way to interpret this new concept that we introduced in this module, this M or the number of modes.